Yeah, thank, you much, thank you very much indeed. It, it's a real pleasure to be here and to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing in, in England over the last few years. Uh, I, I'd like to start though by talking a little bit about my background. I, I was originally a primary school teacher, an elementary school teacher. Uh, and when I moved into higher education and teacher training, I was very frustrated at the amount of information and knowledge there was in academic journals that would have helped me as a classroom teacher. And I could almost see some of the children I'd taught when I read articles about learning to read or articles about how children learn mathematics that I could have helped if I'd known at the time what was in those articles. As we've already heard, one of the problems is the articles aren't particularly accessible to teachers, but also most of them are written in a language that are more likely to send you to sleep than inform your practice the next day. But nevertheless, I, I guess I've made it my mission over the time I've worked in higher education and as a researcher to think about how do we present research, results from research to teachers in a way that informs their decision making. And I should emphasize that that's very much the position I start from. I don't think research can often determine what you should do in the classroom, but I think that it should inform the decisions you make about how to get the best in terms of learning outcomes from the children in your care. And that's a slightly different framing that I'll try and explain as I go through my presentation. So I'm going to talk a bit about the, the Sutton Trust Education Endowment Foundation Toolkit to give it its full title. Uh, I'm going to set that in a context of what I think I've learned about research, communication and use in the five years since we first created it. And that sets up some tensions and limitations that I hope will inform your discussions about next steps uh, as you finish today's conference. I'll talk also a little bit about some future developments that we're planning in terms of the toolkit, because again, it's perhaps helpful to see where we hope that this may go. The Education Endowment Foundation is relatively unique. The, the previous coalition administration in the UK gave uh, two charities, the Sutton Trust and the Impetus Trust, the sum of 125 million pounds to invest to find out what would help break the link between family income and school attainment. And you may know that in England, we do worse on that than almost any country in Western Europe, and certainly much worse than the Scandinavian countries, Nordic countries, in terms of how much, how well you're likely to do at school and how strongly that's linked to what your family earn. So the foundation was set up to build an evidence base to do that. And they started by summarizing the existing evidence, which is where the toolkit comes in. So I'll talk quite a lot about that today, but I should also mention that the Education Endowment Foundation has so far commissioned about 125 randomized trials in education involving uh, one in four schools in England as participants in those trials and affecting nearly 800,000 pupils. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, could we do randomized trials in education, I'd have said no, it's not possible to do that in England. And I just mention that in passing as I go through. Uh, the other thing I'm not going to talk about today is the way the Education Endowment Foundation is now scaling up when it thinks it has sufficient evidence that's relevant to the system, they plan campaigns to think about how we can mobilize evidence across a large number of schools. And that's another element of their work. And you can see that these three things go together in terms of how you summarize evidence, how you test things that you think might work within a system, and then when you've found things that you think are valuable, how you might try and scale and embed them. And Understanding the toolkit in relation to those is quite important. The model I'm going to talk about, and I won't go through these uh, six steps in detail at this point, 
Uh, they're nicely alliterative. Uh, I'm an ex-teacher, so I like alliterative kinds of um, introductions or ways to remember uh, titles. But I, I think these areas of thinking about research, communication and use are both important but also intention. So you want accurate but accessible research. And there's a tension between those two dimensions. How accurate can you make it without turning teachers off? When we started the toolkit, I was persuaded by those I worked with that I shouldn't use effect sizes, normal distributions, and standard deviation units as a way of communicating impact. I am now absolutely certain that that was the right decision. It made it more accessible, but at the same time, it made it less accurate. And those tensions you'll see as I go through the presentation are an important part of the judgments you have to make in developing an effective model for research, communication, and use. I also need to stress that the toolkit was a solution at a particular point in time in policy in England. The government had announced that it wanted to increase the money available for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, and their classification for that was those who receive free school meals in our education system. And then there was a set amount of money per head, per pupil, for children from disadvantaged backgrounds that was going to be given to schools. And schools are going to be asked to account for how they spent that money. And that's the policy context that you need to understand the toolkit is set in, because in some ways it came as a, not exactly a solution, but a help in that policy context, because it aimed to inform schools about how to spend that resource and to help them justify that spending in terms of our inspection framework. So you could see that it was positioned in a way that it made it, its take up more likely at that particular point in time in the policy cycle. We've been astonishingly more successful than I expected to be. Uh, the latest National Audit Office report suggests that about two thirds of head teachers in England consult the toolkit in making decisions about spending. And that has increased fairly steadily since 2011 when the policy came in. What we were trying to do was to summarize evidence from meta-analysis. That's quantitative averages, quantitative aggregates from different areas of educational research, and then relating those ideas uh, in a framework that would help teachers make comparative decisions. And that was one of the unusual things that we did, because most researchers, when they present their results, say, my study has worked, this is what you should do. What we're trying to do in the toolkit is say, here are a whole range of things that have a different amount of impact on teaching and learning, and we can set them within that framework. But I need to emphasize that the toolkit is about averages, and I'll come back to talk about that a little bit later, as found in research studies, which doesn't cover all of educational practice, and they're in terms of tested attainment. So again, it comes at a time when the alignment in terms of international assessment frameworks has encouraged schools to look particularly at some specific outcomes, particularly in terms of literacy and numeracy. So it aligns well with that global context. And I have my own personal reservations about the narrowing of the curriculum we've seen in England as a result of that focus. We've tried to focus on quality designs in terms of their causal warrant. Again, I'm making no claims about the value of different areas of educational research as informative, but I am committed to the idea that some kinds of designs are better for giving causal warrant. We overall estimate the size of the effect. We don't talk about standard deviation units and effect size. We converted those into months of gain. Another of those tensions between accuracy and background won't approve of what we've done because we only look at the additional spend that's at the discretion of the school in terms of those costs. We don't look at teacher time or the resource costs that the school will already have paid for. So it's a limited framework. 
but I come back to the idea that this is aimed to support teachers, particularly leaders in schools, decision-making about what kinds of approaches they should be adopting in schools. So I guess what this produces is a basic cost-benefit analysis of different educational interventions and approaches across a range of areas using average effects from meta-analyses and we've then introduced an idea of, I suppose, the robustness of that evidence, how secure is the evidence in terms of padlocks. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But it's important to recognize that we see this as a way of informing professional decision making, that it creates a framework for evidence synthesis, and that informs the work of the Education Endowment Foundation, because the results of all of their trials then feed back into the toolkit, and it provides a structure that we hope we can improve over time. So this is the basic layout of the toolkit. I guess what was in, uh, what was in my head when I th thought of the original design was something like a consumer guide. I, I don't know if you have a, a, an equivalent in, in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, where uh, someone summarizes what the best buy is in terms of a car or a washing machine and summarizes the different features in different columns and gives an overview of what might be a good purchasing guide. And that was really the model I had in my mind. In terms of education research, what are good buys? What are good bets in terms of what the evidence says? So we clustered loose themes together, and they are very broad. I think, again, one of the criticisms of the toolkit is some of the categories are, are actually quite dissimilar. We chose them because they were the themes that teachers talked about when they were thinking about how to focus their resource on improving outcomes for disadvantaged pupils. So there are 34 themes across different areas. You'll see at the top there, feedback, metacognition and self-regulation, other things like peer tutoring. There are some you may be less familiar with, such as phonics, due to the particular nature of the English language. Teaching sound symbol correspondence is a real difficulty. So systematic approaches to that have been very heavily researched. Um, what we then did was think about, okay, what are the costs? That's the pound signs in the next column. The, the next column along are, are supposed to be padlocks, though one of the questions I get is, what are the little handbags for? We did try a star rating, but people just thought the more stars, the better. So they thought that if there was really robust evidence that something didn't work, you should do it. Well, Padlocks at least try and mitigate that particular issue. And then you can see in this version, the toolkit is ranked by average impact. Uh, the default version on the website, it's just ranked in alphabetical order. Because again, we found initially that all people were doing is looking at the few high value things at the top and ignoring the rest of the information. And what we really want schools to do is to burrow down into the toolkit to the next level, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Most of these themes, I would guess, are quite familiar. Some of them are very broad, digital technology, of particular interest to schools, but an example where the devil really is in the detail. How you use it is certainly more important than what you use, but then exactly how you configure, support, train teachers and students in using technology certainly influences the outcomes. What we know from the plus four in the orange circle at the end is that on average, when people have used digital technology to try and bring about improvement, they've tended to succeed rather than fail. Exactly how that is likely to work in a specific instance isn't reflected in this average sum. There's a range for all of these and all we're doing here is representing that average. You can see that the range as you move down is actually quite dramatic. Some things may not be relevant in particular countries, so things like block scheduling and school uniform. Block scheduling is changing the le length of lessons, and there was some interest in that in the UK a few years ago in terms of having longer lessons for secondary age pupils, what's the evidence around that? Uh, again, what you can see from the zero is that when that's been tried, on average, it doesn't make a difference. 
I need to be clear to say that that doesn't mean it can never work and it doesn't mean it can never make things worse. It just means on average the impact is zero. So as many people have succeeded in doing that as have failed. And that's an important kind of key issue for me in that we don't represent the range. School uniform, again, is a particular topic within the English school system, is that we have some people who genuinely seem to believe that wearing a uniform, a tie, or even a blazer or a boater makes you better at mathematics. Now, that clearly can't be the case. And the average effect of zero indicates, again, that as many schools have failed at bringing in a uniform policy in terms of improving outcomes as those who succeeded. But I think what we often misunderstand in education, that something like that might have been implemented because people had identified problems with the learning relationships and particularly the behaviour and discipline within the school and thought that uniform would improve that. And it was implemented as part of a measure to bring about those changes. So it was an outward symbol of a much more set, much more complex set of practices that aimed to bring about improvement in teaching and learning. So in some cases, it may even have been necessary to renegotiate the relationships between teachers and students in terms of their expectations within school. But as I mentioned before, the average effect of zero suggests that as many failed as succeeded in that. We have an early years version because again in the last few years in England the government extended the pupil premium policy to younger children. And early years education is distinctively different I think in many ways. So helping teachers focus on different emphases and different approaches we thought was really valuable. Okay, this is the top level of the toolkit here. So this is the surface level that you're presented with when you first go to the Education Endowment Foundation website. We thought it was important to layer the information. If you like, the surface version is a teaser that gets people thinking about the relative differences and aims to encourage people to look further at what's causing the differences in impact. So for each of the themes, there's a deeper layer that sets out what we mean by the headline title, in this case, metacognition and self-regulation. So that would be encouraging learners to be strategic, to plan, to monitor, to review their learning. Self-regulation in terms of to take responsibility, not just for the strategies they use, but things like regulating their effort and motivation. Not surprisingly, this comes out as one of the things nearest the top in terms of month's impact, but is also one of the most difficult to achieve. We set out in terms of what the evidence says, what the costs are, and then at the bottom a key set of questions. We originally framed those as statements, but decided it was important that they were framed as questions for those who use the toolkit to answer. Rather than saying you should do this, we're saying this is what we think you should think about. And that kind of negotiation of responsibility is an important part, I think, of its success. For transparency, we also provide a further layer of detail and set out the evidence on which we've made those conclusions at the two layers above. And if you're interested, you can link through using the digital object identifiers to the studies. And again, assuming you have access, which most teachers don't, so we've set out the effect sizes in this case uh, and the abstracts from the studies that are included. So if people want to see the detail of what we've done, it's available. At the moment, we think that most of the people who look at that page are either academics or students studying for higher degrees, but um, we'll, we'll see over time. I mentioned before this compromise between accuracy and accessibility, and this is one that, on balance, I'm comfortable with, but has some problems. So we've basically translated effect size, standard deviation units, into a metric that we thought teachers would understand. We didn't choose test results or test scores because we wanted it to work across the primary and secondary age ranges. But this is a compromise. Progress does vary according to age. 
In fact, educational growth tends to slow as you go through school. Children make really rapid progress through the early years, through uh, primary school, and it tends to slow down as you move into secondary school. So equating months from a five-year-old to a 15-year-old loses some precision. Cost effectiveness, as I mentioned, this is set within the very specific framing of the pupil premium policy in England. So we've looked at the kinds of resources and sums that schools are now responsible for in terms of the education of disadvantaged pupils and set the scale at that level. So the amounts might seem, I don't know how this works in other systems, it will depend a lot on how much responsibility is devolved at school, local authority, municipality level in terms of spend as to how relevant some of this information will be. And I'll come back to that uh, towards the end of the presentation. The handbags I mentioned before, the evidence, the padlocks, the ratings are, are of uh, effectiveness. This again is one of the areas where I think there's the least engagement from practitioners. Uh, when we've talked to them about the, the toolkit, what they basically say, well, Steve, that's your job. We trust you to make those decisions. So for me, it's important to make that transparent. If you go into our technical appendix, we set out exactly how we do that to create a rating scale. It is difficult because I think if you ignore your confidence about the evidence, you can assume it's more certain than it is. And I'd like to find a better way of expressing that uncertainty between five padlocks where you're getting pretty robust and consistent evidence across hundreds if not thousands of studies to one padlock where you've got indicative evidence sometimes relying purely on correlational data, observational <coughs> data. So, and for me, that makes a difference. For most teachers, it doesn't make as much difference. So that discussion about accuracy is then really important. I suppose we've had to take greater responsibility than I'm comfortable with in that quality assurance. But I think that's necessary in terms of communicating the findings. We've done the best I think we can on aggregating data across meta-analyses. And I can defend that I think fairly robustly uh, to my peers about what I think is a good way to summarize evidence across different sets of findings. Because I think we're, we're going for best bets. We're not going for certainties. We're saying that on average, when people have researched this area, this is what we found. Not that this is what you will find if you try this particular approach. And there are some issues. There are assumptions about that research findings are fairly evenly distributed across different fields. Types of studies are. It's very dependent on the scope and quality of the underlying meta-analyses. We've just started doing new meta-analyses in each theme from scratch. But I reckon that will take us about 10 years to complete in converting to all new meta-analyses in each area. Uh, I've also done some work at the Education Endowment Foundation on just analyzing trial results, and we've discovered great or greater imprecision there than I'd like. It's second and third decimal place, but that means that meta-analysis estimates are never going to be more than about a month's uh, precision in terms of our scale. The other thing I'd like to emphasize is that the toolkit, I don't think, provides evidence about what works. We are called the What Works Center for Education and Schooling in England. I'd say that at best, we try and give an estimate of what we think has worked on average in other contexts. I, I, I'm, I'm fairly happy with the internal validity of what we do. External validity is, I think, a problem in education. And particularly in this context, thinking about even variation in schooling across the Nordic countries, being able to generalize from international studies to a precise context is difficult. And that's where I think it needs to inform professional decision making, not give direct instructions for what schools should do. I have some reservations about the way we interpret even the, the, the value of RCTs as they're dependent on average treatment effects on some theoretical population, there's a distribution. Uh, even in the best uh, randomized trial with really clear results, it won't have worked for everyone in that trial. It's just worked well on average. 
And again, that's why I emphasize averages and distributions. We also know that there's a lack of a clear causal link between general additional spending and learning, which means I think it, we need a much more thoughtful way of using spending to bring about improvement. I think we've done well on accessibility. I think that simplified layout with icons for cost, month's progress, and security. Uh, I'll show you some of our website statistics in a minute or two. We get a large number of hits, two-thirds of school leaders saying they're using it. I think we've done well on accessibility, but that may at times have been at the cost of an oversimplistic interpretation. We ha have to develop deeper engagement. The layering is one step towards that. Some of the other messages that the Education Endowment Foundation is now pursuing through campaigns also helps us to get better engagement. But that tension between accuracy and accessibility is important. One incidental thing that we found, and don't worry too much, the, the scale at the bottom will be hard to read, but that's the toolkit ranked. So at the top is feedback, metacognition, self-regulation, peer tutoring, early years intervention, one-to-one, -one, collaborative learning, oral language interventions, mastery learning. Aspects of teaching and learning. This end of the toolkit, you've got things like uh, ability grouping, lesson length, uh, block scheduling, performance pay, the actual nature of the physical environment. Things down here are structural features of the education system. And it's perhaps not surprising that what makes the difference is the quality of interaction in terms of the quality of interaction and feedback between learners and the transfer of responsibility to learners. Um, do, you get this, do you see the Simpsons over here? I, I had what I can only describe as a Homer Simpson moment when I produced this, because I kind of went, duh. That was really, really obvious. Because we know that it's the quality of teaching and learning that makes the difference. And the things in between will only bring about improvement in teaching and learning if they enhance the quality of those interactions. So if you look at social and emotional interventions in terms of learning outcomes or in behavior, behavioral interventions, they'll only make a difference if the changes in behavior or emotions and attitudes lead to better learning. So they may well be a necessary condition to bring about improvement, but they won't be sufficient. And I think in the past, we've perhaps not always pursued that. If you use a behavioral program to improve the quality of behavior in schools, is your goal simply to improve behavior, or are you also looking for improvement in learning outcomes? In which case, you can't just stop with a behavioral change. What the evidence, I think, suggests is that may be necessary, but not sufficient. It also let us start to think about value for money. So some things are definitely more promising. Focusing on things that improve the quality of engagement, the quality of teaching and learning, the quality of the way learners take responsibility for managing their own learning, or look like they're fairly good bets on average. They're likely to be cheap, and they're likely to be beneficial. At the other end, things like smaller classes, the deployment of teaching assistants, after school uh, provision are expensive, so we'll need careful thought before you implement them. I'm not saying it's never a good idea to have smaller classes or that you can't deploy teaching assistants effectively, but on average, they're a high risk. So any decisions involving the implementation of approaches that depend on those, I would argue require greater thought. So I, I see the, the toolkit as a risk register, not as a recipe for the things that you should do, but an indication of where people have succeeded and failed in the past, and that should be a warning for their adoption in the future. So, are practitioners actually using the toolkit? Because we've seen lots of evidence repositories and bases. That, uh, I'm particularly critical of the What Works Clearinghouse in the United States, which I think is a huge database full of really valuable information for practitioners, but it's organized in a way that you really can't find anything that you're interested in. If you don't know it, have a look. It's really hard to find something. Uh, ask a head teacher to find something of value for their school in that, and it's really hard to do. This comes from, um, the data we've got comes from Google Analytics, but also some online reports from schools. 
Schools have to report how they spend the pupil premium on their website. So that's a, a, a dream for me as a researcher because I can just Google school websites and find out how they're spending their pupil premium. Got quite high take up in terms of use over this period, so uh, 800,000 views. I'll, I'll break that down on the next slide so you can see a bit more. Access over time has increased, so over a three month period, our hit rate is now about 40,000 uh, unique page views. And you can see we've built that up from a base in 2011. The, the dip was where we moved to a new website. There was a redesign and we um, changed the website. Big variation in which strands teachers look at or schools look at. Uh, what explains the ones at the top, I'm sure, is partly that they're the highest value in terms of month's progress. Some of the others, mastery learning, uh, if you're familiar with the National Centre National Center for the Excellence in Teaching Mathematics in the UK, uh, they've been promoting mastery learning approaches based on Singapore maths and approaches in Asia. And you could see that schools weren't familiar with that as an idea. So I think we're looking at the toolkit because it was a new theme that they weren't familiar with. The best explanation we can find is that month's progress drives the overall pattern. I was surprised not to see summer schools slightly more represented as we had an initiative a few years ago which gave schools uh, additional money to run summer schools, but actually that doesn't seem to have driven greater engagement. As I mentioned, schools have to report their pupil premium spending, and for some schools these are quite large sums. In one case, nearly a quarter of a million pounds the school gets under this allocation. Uh, lots of schools mention the toolkit. We're not always convinced that they've read it by the things that they choose actually to spend their money on. I think some of them justify the spending post hoc. There are some nice examples, though, where you think not only have they read the toolkit, but they've engaged with it. So the diagrams there, they've actually reversed the chart I had up before. High cost, high impact. So it's the same quadrant diagram, but they flipped it round, which for me means they've actually understood it. Uh, and then they've set their spending against the way they've interpreted the toolkit. So that, that's probably one of our best examples where schools are genuinely engaging with the toolkit. It's not a school I know, not a school so far as I know any of the Education Endowment Foundation have worked with. So we know that some schools at least are using it well. I think there are another couple of challenges around uh, applicability and acceptability that I, I just need to mention. We've tried to make the toolkit applicable across the school age range, from early years through to um, secondary schooling. And we can see that the meta-analyses uh, are run across those age groups and contexts. It draws quite heavily still on the North American evidence, because that's probably where the causal evidence has been um, most vigorously pursued. But when we look at country variation, there usually isn't a huge amount of variation by country in most of the meta-analyses. So we're relatively happy with the applicability. But this averaging only gives us a good general bet that may not always be age or subject specific and may not be country specific. And it also tends to focus on what I think of as pedagogical solutions, teaching and learning solutions, rather than thinking about specific aspects of subject content, say how you teach fractions and decimals in mathematics, which may be a particular problem that requires particular teaching strategies. The one I've got most interested in in my um, six A's model is the notion of acceptability, because it has to fit with teachers' beliefs about what they think will work, but also has to challenge their current practice to move them forward. I think of this in academic language as some kind of zone of proximal professional development. And that can actually be quite narrow in some cases, where there isn't teachers are reluctant to change or try new things, but it's got to fit within what we th they think will bring about improvement. Quite often we work with schools in the Education Endowment Foundation that are enthusiastic, and they have a much bigger tolerance zone for trying new ideas. And I think that's an important feature to bear in mind. Not all schools are equally open to new ideas. And we try and fit that by having a range of options in the toolkit. 
I worry a little bit, though, that sometimes that the, those uh, zones of possible development, if you like, might be a bit narrow, and sometimes the solutions that schools see as acceptable might not be optimal. So an example of that in the UK at the moment is we haven't made much difference on the way that resource is allocated for additional support in terms of one-to-one -one tuition. Now, I think the evidence suggests that for pupils that need that level of extra support, one to two or even one to three intensive teaching is almost always as good at a half or a third the cost. But we're just struggling to deflect that default pattern of, oh, this child needs special, personal, individual attention. What we also have to think about are the solutions that schools are choosing appropriate in terms of what the actual needs are of the school. Going back to my emphasis on that these are average solutions, if you think of that average as a distribution, a high-performing school may f struggle to find good solutions in the toolkit because they're already doing well. They're performing above average. Finding things that will help them is probably going to be more difficult for a school that's struggling when what's helped most schools on average is almost certainly likely to help them. So we have to think a little bit carefully about whether solutions are appropriate to a school in terms of its stage of development, the capabilities of its teachers, and the current performance of its students. And we often forget that the answers from research should really be answers to questions in those specific contexts. It's very unlikely you can find a general solution that will help all schools. We learned that to our cost in England with the literacy and numeracy strategies, where it may well have helped our lowest performing schools with the structure and research-based content that it advocated. At the same time, it almost certainly curtailed innovation, curtailed excellence, as teachers felt they had to comply with a particular model of teaching and learning. So again, I think that's a particular challenge. How do you maintain and drive excellence and innovation whilst at the same time supporting and improving those who are struggling within the school system? My argument is we have to focus on professional diagnosis and judgment and that approaches like this need to be linked with continuing professional development to encourage teachers and schools to be able to diagnose and work out when specific solutions fit. Where we're weakest is in terms of how the toolkit helps things to be actionable. Our evidence often helps you with the what, but don't explain the why or how something brings about improvement. Solutions have to be practical and manageable, but they've also got to retain or even improve the causal pathway from the research. That's not straightforward. You can often find things that are consistent with the evidence, but you don't actually know if they're the key causal pathway. I'm just going to talk for a, just a moment or two about the EF's wider work, because again, that helps get it in context, I think, and brings back, us back to why the EF is now pursuing campaigns to address that last point about what's actionable. I'm responsible for the toolkit with my team at Durham. We do systematic searching, regular updates, and create a synthesis. And on the basis of that, EEF commissions projects in areas that it thinks are promising based on the existing evidence base. They work in partnership with our Department for Education, with charities, to extend the money that's available. They'll often co-fund projects. The work I'm involved in in the northeast of England, uh, the EEF matched £5 million from the Northern Rock Foundation to develop literacy in primary schools. So that means we've got a £10 million fund to spend over six years developing more trials, trying out research-based approaches. We communicate with practitioners. We develop campaigns, as I mentioned before. Uh, if you're interested, please do look on the EEF website, at the, the, the latest strategies the EEF's developing about engaging practice, working with practice partners to try and embed research-based findings across the profession. Of course, practitioners access the toolkit directly and it has policy influence. We're also developing some international partnerships. There's a version of the toolkit now in Australia, and we're currently in discussions with Fundacion Chile to develop a version of the toolkit for Latin America. Our approach there is that in the Australian version, the overall structure 
the global level content is very much the same. The layout, the headings uh, 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 look very similar to the version that's available in England. The definitions and overall estimates of effectiveness remain consistent. And then there's local costing translated both into the local currency but also local cost estimates. And then the global content is mediated with local searches about relevant research in Australasia that's then presented to contextualize the overall global content. And this seems to be a model that we think may work more widely. We're influenced, of course, by um, movements in systematic reviewing, uh, and movements in, in the area of meta-analysis. We try to keep up to date with the latest methods. Uh, it's not always easy, because lots of the academic approaches, I'm going to smile at Camilla in a moment, are extremely time-consuming and extremely expensive to do. So how you main, maintain quality, but also cost-effectively as a systematic reviewer is a real challenge. Uh, we're trying to develop new, comparable, and updatable meta-analyses for each strand. That might let us de derive both more precise estimates, but it might also let us identify more variation at regional or national level. I'm going to finish on the model that I started with, because as I mentioned at the beginning, I think that you've got to get all of these aspects of research communication and use almost in a row in terms of knocking the dominoes down for it to be successful but there are also tensions that pull in you in different directions so what I want to do in terms of accuracy may not actually enhance the accessibility of the toolkit how you balance those dimensions in a model of research communication and use is I think extremely important and I, I, I'm absolutely confident that you will see these tensions in the work that you do in this network. Thanks very much. <laughs>